Heads are up. Mr. Allen. <laughs> Easy to get a camera crowd flat. Um, so, uh, but we really, really lucky to kind of have so much history at this camp, and you know, we, we converted the dining hall to kind of this historical display of everything. And um, I'm going to introduce our historian in just one minute, but we actually we have a, a celebrity here at camp. Um, so when talking about all of the changes that have happened at camp, it's very important to rec still recognize those campers uh, that were here um, in, in the, the, the times that we're talking about. So um, right over here, I don't know if you know Paul Cuppinger, but he is our oldest camper here. Uh, he uh, was at camp in 42, 43, and 44. <laughs> With some adjustments. With some adjustments, yeah. <laughs> uh, we wanted to formally recognize Paul in uh, having our oldest alumni here at our 100th anniversary. We were very, very lucky. So we have this uh, certificate for him. Um, for, uh, it says for Paul Cuppinger, the earliest Corey alumni at the 100th anniversary, proudly uh, carrying the spirit of Camp Corey forward. So Paul It's probably the role he's most famous for is our, our camp historian. Um, has committed countless hours in making sure that we are preserving the history and traditions of camp. And he is going to talk about that in a sure great detail. Um, and beyond that, um, you know, many of you know this, many of you are lucky enough to be Bo's friend. He's a fantastic guy who we are very, very lucky to have here. So Bo Shoemaker, everybody. <laughs> everyone, it's not a very good presentation. <laughs> uh, so, thank you. Um, Humor. I didn't do really any of this history stuff here. That was done by several other people and it is amazing. So, I mean, thank you to all those people. Uh, what I thought I would do for the presentation was touch on a couple of the things that aren't touched upon in any of these displays out here. So, a couple of learning outcomes. We're going to talk about Camp Iola, which is Camp Corey's predecessor. And who was Lawrence Corey? Uh, I think there's a display over there of Lawrence Corey. There's a little summary over there. Probably you've all seen just that one picture that's been duplicated many, many, many times around camp. Uh, but we'll just talk about a little bit more about... Um, it's kind of morbid. Not, I was about to say his life, but we're not really going to talk about his life, are we? Uh, so, summer camps started in the 1800s, often the first one is considered to be, in 1861, it was a gunnery camp. Uh, obviously, no, it, it's not the most continuously, or the longest continuously operational, but it, here it is. Um, I call this Operation Let's Get Our Boys Out of the City. Essentially, people were moving from farms into cities. There was a big worry about uh, literally, the worry was that the boys would be overly feminized by living in the city. The other concern was that uh, children would be uh, morally bankrupt if they um, didn't have exposure to nature and like, you know, nature's God and God was kind of seen as being in nature and the city was kind of seen as being not very spiritual and not a very moral place. So in the 1870s and 1880s, there were lots more camps throughout the country. I think in the 1890s, there a hunt started the decade with 100 summer camps and ended the decade with over 1,000. In 1892, the Rochester YMCA started the Rochester Camping Party, which had no name. I mean, that had a name, but that's the name. Um, and this picture is actually right out here. And you can see it's... Um, Back then, the world was more brown and faded. Uh, you can see, the first time I ever saw this, I was like, oh cool, they're having a dress up day. And they have these neat little tents. And then I'm starting to think to myself, they're not having a dress up day. It's 1892 and they're dressing as per usual. So you can see it's a tent, a tent. Uh, most of the records that we have say that it's two men, 14 boys, a couple of tents, a couple of rowboats, and a, a, presumably a picnic table. And they were just on Lake Ontario camping for a couple of weeks. And this is the very first Rochester YMCA junior camping party. 
not called Camp Iola yet, but they were camping. Um, this is from the next year, 1893. Note uh, the cost, $7.50 got you a couple of weeks at camp. <laughs> Inflation, Probably about though. the same now. <laughs> Camp Iowa. Uh, everyone's got these little Tory C's, right? On their... Okay, the Camp Iowa logo was essentially the same, but the C was for Camp and the I was for Iowa. Um, Camp Iowa was kind of evolved out of the Rochester YMCA camping party. There were young boys, old boys, and men. It was for adults, too. They were for about two weeks each and each of them could be in all different locations in a particular summer. So a Camp Iola was not a location. Um, if this were like a Disney movie, you'd say like camp was in your heart. There was no <laughs> yeah. actual place at Camp Iola. So it was on Sodus Bay, it was on Canada Ice Lake, it was in the Thousand Islands. And then the place that it was probably at the most was Tichenor Point, I think that's how you pronounce it, on Canandaigua Lake. Uh, the point's actually still there. I Google Maps it about 20 minutes ago, and it still pops up. It's right across Canandaigua Lake. If you're familiar with Canandaigua Lake, um, Crystal Beach, it's like right across the lake from Crystal Beach. So Camp Iola was there for maybe over a decade. Um, here is a brochure from 1898, back when it was on Canisius Lake. This is obviously the junior, so it's a junior camp, senior camp, men's camp. Um, Anybody could go. Yeah. Safety was a little different back then. <laughs> <laughs> the diving tower, such as it was. Yeah. <laughs> and they didn't care. This was not, they publicized this back. This was like not an issue back in the 1890s, 1900s. Look, a great diving tower. This is not a problem. This person's standing up. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> So here is a brochure from when Iola was at Canandaigua Lake. You can see it was in Canandaigua, 1917. Um, here's the tents, all the boys standing in front of their tents. Here's someone with that Camp Iola logo on their shirt. This is the life. This is, is this a trough? Are they literally drinking out of trough? Um, I love the hats. Those will kind of come back into style, right? Aaron, you were wearing one of those today, right? Good job. And then, um, 20, so, so they're dating back, obviously, to 1892 at this point. This is, look who this is addressed to. It's addressed to Colonel S. Oh e. Mulgrew. He lived on 40 Phelps Avenue. City. City. That's all you can do back then. Real boys. Yeah. Okay. Here's Colonel Mulgrew. This man, where's Jerry? This man was the Jerry Elliott of his day. He was the camp director. He was the they actually called him the Camp Commandant. <laughs> For like decades he was there. He was, the, he was the guy at Camp Iola. I feel like every camp uh, that's been around for over 100 years needs someone like this with this mustache. <laughs> and with, he was not really a colonel. Uh, <laughs> the honorary rank of colonel. He, was, he did try to join uh, the army, the Union Army in the Civil War. I think he was like 12 or 13. And once the, they found out this like child was with them, they sent him back home. Uh, the reason he's called Colonel Multhrop is he was really involved in veteran stuff and like organizing marches in Rochester. He was a school teacher also. Um, kind of did everything. He designed a type of desk called the Multhrop desk that they used in schools for like decades. There was a tree dedicated to him up near the Seneca Park Zoo. He was a big deal in Rochester. I actually learned a lot about him, not from camp history, but from an article written about him in the city of Rochester, like Rochester City uh, Journal. So he did, he was really into the army because of his honorary uh, title. Every picture of him is basically with a bunch of kids doing these like military routines. Um, so Camp Iola was on Titchener Point, Canandaigua Lake. They rented it. They did not own the land. The Y just kind of rented this land. There was some other science-y thing happening there that gave, made the land available. All the newspaper articles I'm seeing in 1917, 1918, they're like, we're gonna buy this land, it's gonna be great. It's like, really, it's gonna happen. But it fell through. I don't know why, they never got the land. Someone got cold feet, I don't know, too expensive. In 1920, Camp Iola moved to the Cuca site, which is here. 
Um, I don't know if it was still called Iola at that point. Everything I see just says Cuca site on it. Uh, there's nothing that I've seen, and if anyone has seen it, please show it to me. There's nothing that I've seen that calls I, uh, this location Iola. In so it was moved here in 1920. I don't really know where the year 1921 came from. Um, <laughs> Maybe because it's like between 20 and 22. So, uh, is anyone here living in or from New York City? No one. One person. Okay. The city seal for New York City has a date on it that is also similarly made up. It's just kind of like, we could pick this date, or this date, or this date. Let's pick one kind of in the middle, and that's when we'll say New York City was founded. So, I don't know if that's what 1922 or 21 came from. 22 is, from what I can see, that's the year we have the first culminary. Culminary is not a word. It's a made-up word that the Camp Quarry people use to describe their yearbooks. Um, but in 22, the Cupid Camp was named Camp Lawrence Quarry after H. Lawrence Quarry. That gentleman. Right there. Right there. Who was he? Why was it named after him? <laughs> oh, boy. Trigger warning? Is that what supposed to say? This is about World War I, so there's some more stuff. And spoiler alert, someone dies. <laughs> um, it is, uh, obviously, every death is a tragedy. War deaths are also a tra tragedy. I think in order to talk about it in a historical manner, and also we're pretty far removed from it, and I think a lot of good came out of it, i.e. us being here. So I'm going to kind of talk about it in a bit of a lighthearted manner. Sorry if that offends anyone. September, this is the way they dated things, the, the British way. 21, 22 September 1918, there was an assault on a farm in like France, Belgium area in World War I. Doe Corp, maybe, is how you pronounce that. There was a city, we're about to see a map. Uh, for you World War I nerds, it was after the St. Mihail Offensive. There was a calm before a big news Argon offensive, which is essentially the offensive that ended with the end of World War I. So this is like, it wasn't during a big offensive. The, the assault on Montplaisir Farm was kind of a mini thing that's not really written about anywhere other than stuff that concerns us here at Camp Ford because our guy took part in it. Here, there's the Montplaisir Farm. Yes. <laughs> uh, so here's the out the outport when I told you about the Fort's got city. Um, it looks actually quite beautiful. I kinda wanna visit there. There is a war memorial there or near it that has Lawrence Quarry on it. And there's the farm. This red line describes the front lines at a certain point in World War One, the American front lines. Well, I'm not gonna read this, don't worry. But the really, really cool thing about being a camp historian is that somehow these Letters from 1918, 1919, 1920 survived in a cardboard box in what we used to call the Frotus Closet. It was a closet in the store on top of a like cooler. It was a cardboard box with stuff that was 100 years old. I'm so glad it just kind of sat there presumably for decades. Um, but we have them. We have all these letters. Um, not to plug my book, but if you want to actually read them, there are, many of them are scanned into a book called The History of Camp Quarry, which you can buy here at the store. You can also buy it on Amazon. Uh, I'm carrying a pen with me the entire weekend, and I'll sign a copy. So most of the letters are from people in Lawrence Quarry's unit, this 310th Infantry Machine Gun Company. He was a lieutenant, which uh, it's like a platoon leader kind of. Uh, he'd lead like 20 to 40 guys. Um, and they were in machine gun companies. There's a few platoons to this company. This is a letter from another guy in the American Expeditionary Forces. Most of the letters are to the quarries, so presumably we, I, got them because the quarries kept them. Yeah. I just want to go back. Censored. Okay, some of them, it's, some of them are like actually censored. Um, and then this was kind of tough for me to read, so you'll see some points in my book I'll put like question mark. I think that's what it says. Essentially, here's what we get from the letters, and here's what we get from the actual official history of the 79th Division, which is what Division Lawrence Quarry was part of. So here's the outcourt, here's the line, this is uh, the offensive that ended right before, so remember the 22nd is the night that he participated in the assault that uh, ended in his death. So here's the line, we go back, this is the same map I showed you before, here's the line that here from, right there. Here's the line. Here, so the Montclosier farm belongs to the Germans 
It was like a machine gun nest. It was kind of an everything nest. It was a German stronghold. They couldn't be moved from it. And for those of you who know anything about World War I, the mines didn't move a ton. So the Americans are basically stuck here for weeks. This is seen as a German strong point that they need to knock out in order to progress. Uh, spoiler, well, I'll get there. So here was the plan. Uh, Lawrence Corey's unit was going to move up to the farm at night. There was going to be uh, troops on this side and this side. The machine gun platoons were going to form like covering fire on the sides. They form a little path like this. While the path was open, engineers were going to come in and destroy the farm. Like literally mine it with scuff and blow it up so the Germans couldn't use it anymore. The machine gun company had to hold their position for I think it was one hour, like solid. Like from 1, 0, 0, 0100 to 0, 0200, you will hold your line. I might be getting those times wrong. They did that. They, the machine gun company succeeded in its mission 100%. Unfortunately, the engineers never showed up. So, but when that happens in the army, especially in the year 1918, you don't. When you, if you're the machine gun company, you don't just say, "Oh, they never showed, so we're not gonna." You know, we'll, we'll fall back. No, their orders were not to do this only if the engineers showed. Their orders were do this. So they held for an hour. Engineers never showed. At the end of the hour, they had orders to fall back. As they're falling back, they come over very, very heavy German gunfire. Uh, it's unclear exactly how this happened, but there was either, either Lawrence Corey was just hit, or what some people said in the letters was, they're coming back, and he and his machine gun company are providing covering fire. And while they're doing that, obviously to provide covering fire, you have to shoot at the enemy. They see a group of people in the dark. Again, it's like 2 in the morning, something like that. They don't know if the people they see are Americans or Germans. So Lawrence Corey, as the officer, he's kind of supposed to be the leader. He doesn't just send an underling out to confirm the identity of the Germans or Americans. He kind of goes out, and it was sort of a, from what I understand, who goes there type of situation. And who went there were Germans. They shot him. Uh, he, didn't, he was captured along with a few of his other, his, his soldiers. Um, and he seemingly wasn't really cared for, medically speaking, and he perished within a few minutes. This is Montplaisir Farm in the winter after the war ended. It did kind of get demolished. But from what I can read, the Germans never left it during the war. The Americans never succeeded in actually driving the Germans from the farm until the war actually ended. Here's another. This is the official letter from the War Department uh, to the Corries. It took years for them to officially confirm that Lawrence Corrie, like you get, they were getting letters Section of East Avenue, and um, no, it's a uh, uh, Culver. So there's a big mansion on the uh, uh, southeast side of that intersection. That is that mansion. So uh, Harvey Corey was one of the two heads of the Alling and Corey Paper Company. If you go to Frontier Field, there's a plaque that's where their factory used to be. A big deal. Hence how he was able to kind of help get all this set up. So after Lawrence Curry Paris, here's 1920, as I said, we're kind of going to kind of combine both learning outcomes at this point. We're talking about Iola and Lawrence Curry. So they're at the Cuca site. It's not called anything, really. Rochester, White, Camp for Boys, no name. This bridge, does anyone think they know what this bridge is? Is it? Oh. Which one? You think it's that one? I tend to think it's the other one. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Because that's the dining hall, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking this is the one kind of behind that's 10, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to be sure. You see a lot of old photos, and sometimes you think you see a building in the background that may or may not be. Um, so this is 21. It's still apparently not called Cory, not called Iola. Here's the camp attendance. I mean, I don't need to like, read this out for you, but this is from the end of your back um, This is my writing. And it's, I think I'm right, but I'm really not sure. Some, some parts in the book are uh, educated guesses. Um, 
Continuity, Milo Corey, who's this guy? Where is that window? Right there. So this is the old dining hall porch, which is now what the, I used to call the nine room seating section. Um, I'm sorry if this laser's being people. <laughs> um, so there are, there, this is nature study with Colonel Mulfrup. Colonel Mulfrup continued on at Camp Quarry after it became the camp at Cuca, and I believe after it was even named Camp Quarry. I love these eating cats that had in this place. More continuity between Iowa and Quarry. This guy here with the arrow is Mike Myron, who must my name. He was he was a camper at Iola. He became a junior leader here in 25, which as best as I can tell means he started the summer as a camper, and then either he was good enough or they were short staffed enough and they needed to kind of help out. So junior leaders would start the summer in one cabin as a camper, they would end the summer in a different cabin as a junior leader. Um, he was also auxiliary bugler. When the real bugler had a cough or something. <laughs> 1922, this guy here left from row, Skyler Wells, oh, wow. right there, from, from, of, after whom Wells Village is named. Uh, similar story with him, he's a junior leader in 1922. Both Wells, okay, so Mike Migrant went on to become a staff member. He was like a utility counselor. He left, he came back, he was kind of a celebrity counselor. The you know, celebrity counselors seemingly still exist today. The ones that been here forever. <laughs> well, seemingly it was the same way. Uh, Migrant was also on the board, uh, like the Camp Board Board of Management. And as we get into 1922, we're now talking about what is officially Camp Board. As far as I can tell, July 4th, 1922, is the official dedication, the official actual naming of the Cuca site as Camp Board. A Camp Board flag went up the black hole for the first time in July, on July 4th, 1922. The first culminary was in 1922. Uh, all of the culminaries, I believe, have been scanned in and are at www.cory.camp for free. Um, they're really, really, really cool. Back in the day, every single camper and counselor got a like, paragraph written about them. Um, so you can really, in a lot of pictures, too, a lot of really cool pictures. So I really, some of them are here. I also greatly encourage you to go to Corey.camp Camp and read through the culinaries. So, I don't know if any of you saw the subtitle at the beginning. I think I called it 100 Years Historical Fact or Marketing Decision. Um, it is 100 years, really. Actually, 2022 is, well, anyway. The point of this is, it doesn't really matter. What the year was, 1892 is when the first camp, the camping, Rochester Y camp started. It's been continuous since then. 1920, they came to the Cuca site. By the way, the deeds for the Cuca site are available at the Yates County uh, Clerk's Office, and I've looked at them, and they're written in this really cool calligraphy. Um, and it, originally, camp only went to the creek. This is not really part of the PowerPoint, it's just I'm going to nerd out for a little bit. The camp historian. Camp went to the creek, and the deed, the way the deed is worded, it was like, it goes, the land goes to the creek, it goes down, and then the creek goes through a tree. Like through a giant oak tree, and that's where the property line is. 1921, which is what a lot of the date, uh, a lot of the documentation says, is kind of the, the founding of the Camp Quarry. 1922, and 21 may very well have been when it was officially, this is, the, this is our place now, maybe that's when the, these were finalized. This building was dedicated in 23, it looks like. Um, the first couple of buildings was this building, the store, which was at that point called the Isabel Cook Manual Training Building, where you see pictures and it's these boys all making wallets, and it looks kind of like forced labor, but I think, I think they were good. <laughs> um, so my theory, I guess, if I have to reach a conclusion, is that it's all of them, all of these years. Um, I'm not going to take any questions in front of all of you because it's a beautiful day and there's stuff to do and I don't want to keep you from activities, but I'll stick around. I'll be here all weekend if people want books to be signed. I'll stick around if anyone wants to chat or if anyone has a question right now. I'm really sorry. I'm going to cut you off there because we have a surprise for you. I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like I said, Bo's been doing this for a very long time. Um, 
And so uh, we actually wanted to uh, issue a special award to Bo. So um, the inscription reads, um, for his commitment to preserving the history and traditions of YMTA Camp Corey, this award for recognition of special service is presented to Robert Bo, <laughs> Shoemaker, for exceptional dedication to the campers of the past and those yet to come. So. Good job, all. Thanks, Bill.